Welcome to Rune Soup, a weekly podcast about magic, culture, and the paranormal. My name is Gordon, and I shall be your host. This week, we are joined from Sri Lanka by Dr. Chandra Wickramasinghe. Dr. Wickramasinghe's astronomy and astrobiology career, stretching over many decades, has taken him all over the world. He has worked with, published, and befriended some of the 20th century's leading space thinkers, including the legendary Sir Fred Hoyle and Arthur C. Clarke. He joins us today to talk about panspermia, evolution, and the origins of life on Earth. Dr. Wickramasinghe, thank you very much for your time. It's a pleasure meeting you. It's a pleasure talking to you. Great. Well, absolutely. And uh, you probably may not be aware, but we have a traditional first question for first-time guests on the podcast, which is, Dr. Wickramasinghe, were you a weird kid? I, I wouldn't have thought so, no. I was weird in the sense that I was bookish. And uh, when my other friends and so on used to go out and uh, do silly things and uh, so on, I was reading my books. So to that extent, uh, I was... Maybe you could say odd, a little bit odd. So. And what sort of books were they? Do you remember any, do you have any early childhood books that you remember as being particularly transformative? Uh, well, I think I remember uh, Alice in Wonderland, which is a girl, really a girl story. I thought it was great. It was a great story. And uh, it's, the author is called Lewis Carroll. But he was actually a math, really quite a uh, distinguished mathematician, Don, who. Uh, wrote the, these stories, and uh, so what, that's one of the stories. But I also started on science fiction quite early in my sort of early teens. I was reading books like uh, Arthur C. Clarke's uh, novels, and I got to know Arthur Clarke really quite well uh, after I came to Cambridge and met him in England first, and then several times after that in, in Sri Lanka, because Arthur, Arthur Clarke lived most of his life in Sri Lanka, and he wrote his, I think, one of his sort of monumental books was 2001, which was written in Sri Lanka. So I've, I, I knew him well, but I've read some of his earlier stories uh, when I was a kid. So it was your way into science via science fiction then? To, to a certain extent it was, yeah, I think so. I think I uh, started off reading science fiction, and it was really quite... Uh, intrigued by the ideas that uh, these authors expressed, which was mostly sort of exaggerated science, science taken a few steps further into the future. And, uh, and that's always interested me, sort of projecting into the future. Oh, absolutely. Uh, there is, in fact, an Arthur C. Clarke anecdote in your latest book, Cosmic Womb, which I found, and I'm sure the listeners would, uh, particularly interesting in reference to a book you co-authored with Sir Fred Hoyle. And I'm wondering if you could uh, recount yeah. that anecdote for us. Yeah, that's, that is very, it is very funny because uh, he, Arthur, C., Arthur Clarke followed my work really very closely especially when it came to alien origins and uh, organic molecules, life molecules in space and so on. This, this was uh, his stuff because he was writing about uh, intelligent aliens. And uh, uh, so on one occasion, I went to visit him and we had written this book called Diseases from Space. It uh, occupied a very prominent place on his bookshelf. And so I w my eyes turned to this book and uh, so Arthur noticed this and said, uh, Chandra, do you know that I had two weeks ago a visit from someone very high up in the American intelligence? They pulled, uh, he pulled this book out of the shelf and flicked through the pages and said, you know, Arthur, these guys have got something here that we already know. And so this was, this was really quite intriguing. Whether he made this up or not, I don't know, whether Arthur C. Clarke's vivid imagination got to work and he imagined this conversation. I'd rather think not. Uh, and I still think that uh, there's been a lot of information that's been sort of uh, uh, not made generally um, into the public domain. About yeah, it, it, has the, um, it has the ring of truth, because one of the questions uh, I have that we're going to get onto, which we might as well now, is um, why do you suppose um, 
it's probably multiple factors, but there does appear to be uh, historically some very rigid ideological barriers around um, the kind of investigative science and uh, and theories that you have put out over your career, for instance. And this that has the ring of truth to it, doesn't it? I think so. I think we really think that we need to be uh, supreme in the universe. I think human beings have got to a stage when they really feel this is of paramount importance to to assert and to continue reasserting their preeminence in the universe. So this essentially means that uh, other life could not be there, uh, because if other li- other forms of life, even primitive life, exists on a really huge scale, which I think it does beyond any question, if that really is the case, then one has to admit that uh, these very simple life forms, if they got together and made you and me and us and animals and humans and so on on the earth, the same process would have happened in many, many other places. And it's very hard to uh, believe that in terms of intelligence, in terms of human intelligence, we are anywhere near the end of the road. I think that we are probably nearer the beginning than the end of the road. And so this means then that there must be uh, intelligent life really in far-flung places in the galaxy and uh, even wider field in in the universe. Uh, Recent studies have shown that uh, planets like the Earth, planetary systems like our solar system, are by no means unique. Uh, We used to think that maybe the solar system was rather a special place, and there are not many of these things uh, around in the world, in the universe at large, but now I think the astronomical evidence is absolutely 100% secure, uh, and it's no doubt that uh, in our galaxy alone, there are probably over 100 billion solar systems, planetary systems like our solar system, containing uh, habitable planets, uh, like the Earth, and so I think the, the, the uh, old ideas of uh, the Earth being unique, or life on Earth being unique, and so on, is now just absolutely, absolutely obsolete because it's abandoned. Mm. Yeah. Um, one of the things I was wondering, if the Arthur Clarke story is correct, is what would make it a CIA issue? Is it the the impact on worldviews, or is there, because the book is called Diseases from Space, uh, is there the horrifying possibility that there was a bioweapons angle that they were uh, interested in it from? I think the bioweapons angle must be an important consideration for, if it is a CIA type uh, uh, aversion to this kind of uh, result, this kind of discovery, I think it has to be something like that. But on a, on a sort of bigger scale, I think it probably means that uh, that we, if we admit that there is uh, microbial life coming into the earth, then we've got to admit that there may be even other more advanced life forms uh, not too far from us, and that would pose uh, a kind of security security threat uh, that uh, a perceived threat. I don't think it re- it need ne- necessarily be a threat to the earth, but this could be one of the considerations, I suppose. I mean, there was a, a, a comment that came not a few months ago, very close to the Earth, it, the, the first ever interstellar comet that was detected. And, uh, and this was uh, uh, looked at, and it's a big, very peculiar object. It's a cigar-shaped object. It's very much like one of the uh, spacecraft that was described in an Arthur C. Clarke novel called Rendezvous, Rendezvous with Rama. Right? This, this, uh, this spacecraft in, in the novel makes, uh, actually makes a landing on, on the Earth. But uh, now we have this cigar-shaped object that uh, was first spotted in October of this year, and now it's uh, going away from the solar system. And, and there's been some serious discussion as to whether it could be an alien spacecraft. I think it's rather like not, but uh, one never knows. Well, um, this is Oumuamua, of course, and uh, oh. listeners to the show are, would be familiar with um, that. For, for my money, given that there was the um, 
in December, the front page of the New York Times rolling out, uh, you know, military industrial types to say that they're a craft. Um, for my money, the real disclosure event was uh, Oumuamua, because um, I, I've spoken to people about this. It's kind of heads, it's aliens, tails, it's aliens, because it is either a ship, or if it's not, the only way for it to be, uh, if it's a normal object, then what you have is a very important vector for panspermia, and hence it's aliens. So it's uh, I, I thought it was the most remarkable thing to have happened last year. I, I'm a big fan of Oumuamua. I'm yeah, sorry to see it I go. So. Yeah, yeah, it's going away from us. But I think I think there's enough information left in uh, in the in the process of studying it and so on that uh, the, the things which probably could work out uh, almost as sort of decisive proof that. Uh, the aliens, at least microscopic aliens, have come here and have gone. Uh, that's that. That would be my point of view. I, and I've written a few papers with my colleagues on it, which are in press at the moment. I think the 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 minimalist explanation would be that it's a, a weird kind of natural spacecraft that is brought uh, along with its uh, inorganic material is brought. Uh, seeds of life that would have been dispersed into our solar system and sooner or later our planets in our solar system maybe the earth also would receive some of this uh, microbial genetic legacy and I, I, I think this is the way that life has progressed on the earth it's been continually um, injected with new material with new genes uh, with new uh, body plans and so on and so this this is Maybe a continuing process that we we've seen with more more more. Well, I I agree. I think that's a very important point because if it is if it is not an unusual object, so if it isn't Rama, right? Um, if it's not that, then for it to be usual, um, there has to be countless numbers of them moving in between different solar systems, and that just seems to me if it's uh, it's almost like. Um, the epidemiology or the epidemiological vectors um, uh, of of moving, you know, the material of life uh, in between solar systems. Because that, I, we follow this very closely. Is it a ruined spacecraft? And if it's not, if it's normal, then they're in between, kind of like a Walmart parking lot. Um, various solar systems all across the galaxy. There are countless numbers of these things darting yeah. about. Yeah. Yeah. So yes, yeah, it's, it's not a solitary object by any means. It's got to be one of trillions of these things that are darting around and uh, essentially exchanging genetic material between different uh, habitable systems, inhabited systems. So, so yeah, it's like a sick person in the uh, in the Earth's um, you know air transport network. Yeah, you you just spread stuff uh, wherever you go because you have all these objects moving between airports and countries. Yeah, that's the idea. Yeah, let's look at let's get a definition for for the other side. The um, well, we consider the defunct side. Um, what's abiogenesis? Abiogenesis is a, is a belief system that uh, was essentially instituted instituted by one of the the the, the, the most uh, remarkable philosophers of all time, and this is Aristotle in the fourth century BC. Uh, he made very many observations and uh, um, he made many, many propositions, philosophical propositions that we still respect and so on. But he he also made two of the biggest mistakes ever. And one mistake was to say that the Earth was the center of the, the universe and, uh, and this was really maintained, upheld against all of the scientific astronomical evidence for thousands of years and we all know that the Copernican revolution was a very hard fought revolution against the Aristotelian idea of the earth being at the center of the universe but the other um, proposition that I have taken exception to in terms of Aristotle is the, is the abiogenesis idea that you just mentioned that life is centered on the earth uh, and that uh, life just arises from non-living material, um, like and he's described like in various metaphors. Uh, one such metaphor is fireflies emerging from a mixture of warm earth and morning dew. 
and there are many variants of this, but uh, just mix up any non-living material on the earth and you get life. It's, this is Aristotle's uh, philosophy, Aristotle's idea, and that, had beca that became really deeply rooted in, uh, in sort of scientific culture uh, almost to the present day. Um, there have been so many different uh, disproofs over the centuries, and the last such disproof was Louis Pasteur, the great biologist of the 19th century. Uh, he showed that microorganisms are always derived from pre-existing microbes. And at that point, this is at the end of the 19th century, the old Aristotelian, Aristotelian principle of spontaneous generation of abiogenesis should have been just thrown, thrown out of the window. And uh, it wasn't because Aristotle is such a powerful figure, has been such a powerful figure in history, in the history of philosophy, in, in world history, uh, in European history, certainly. Uh, so this didn't happen, and, and it sort of really moved into the, into the present century. And even now, I think people are really uh, finding, are finding it very difficult to accept facts that are going against the veracity of abiogenesis. There is not a shred of evidence that uh, supports the, the conventional point of view, uh, which is the point of view that is expressed in every first page of every textbook in biology. And, and it says that there was a primordial soup and so on, and from this primordial soup, simple life forms uh, to spontaneously arose. So that's that's the backdrop. And yeah, that, uh, I um, I follow this very closely because in every six weeks or so, you'll see in the uh, science media press releases um, some nonsense about um, trying to get those um, those sort of early. Uh, proteins to to come together in in a soup, and you read the article, and it's a computer game. They've done a they've done a computer um, simulation of what could have yeah. possibly happened, and then wrote yeah. a press release. And you go, this is not science at this it's point. Nonsense! It's nonsense, isn't it? I mean, I, I I don't know how people can even believe what they what they say and write. And these are. Some of them are quite uh, competent and highly respected scientists. And when they make these statements, I think they have been absolutely brainwashed over many generations that so they can't shake off their prejudices, their irrational prejudices. Because after all, the, 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 the whole point of life is to generate an enormous type, enormous uh, volume of information, a sort of astronomical quantity of information. Uh, that is needed to build even the simplest uh, sort of amino acid chain that makes an enzyme or a chain of nucleotides that make uh, a sensible uh, stretch of DNA. Uh, and and it, it, it doesn't take really high-powered maths to show that the probability of getting from a random soup of uh, nucleotides or a random sort of mix of amino acids uh, to a working biological system is the probability is just uh, absolutely super astronomically minuscule so um it can't it, it can't just be aristotle i mean my observation is um if defense of this um evidence free belief system uh, springs from uh, if they allow um, this sort of cosmogenesis panspermia idea to be what it is, which is our best current understanding for how these things, uh, you know, for life on Earth, uh, it has it, it kind of kicks the door open onto some the stuff I like, some very profound philosophical implications, which shake the entire um, model, which is itself their belief system, uh, rather than being what science is. And it just seems to me that if they keep the Earth as a closed system, as a terrarium, um, not only do they get to retire um, with their career, you know, intact, or their body of work still currently being credible, but it's it's a really big deal. It's a really big deal if they go, do you know what? Um, as Pasteur says, all life comes from life. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, 
I think so. I think, I think to, to, to abandon that is to throw everything away, isn't it? To, 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 to just reject everything that you've been brought up on and so on. So it's, it's difficult. I think we are very conservative animals. Human beings are exceedingly conservative. We, as individuals, we don't like to change our, our house where the, that we live in. or Maybe we like to change our car from time to time, but certainly moving house is a very traumatic uh, business, isn't it, for any of us. So we, we like to keep to the cozy comforts of our uh, existence, and we don't like to change things. I think that's the, the bottom line. We are so conservative that we've been brought up in the belief that, uh, that uh, life is centered on the earth, and essentially that we are alone in the universe also. I think that is taken for granted almost, and we don't like to uh, change that point of view. Yeah, absolutely. It's a isn't it? It's a threat also to think that there may be super intelligent uh, characters, creatures, perhaps not so far from us. It's, it's a bit of a daunting thought. I think it's exciting, Dr. Vikramasing. <laughs> yeah. I find it exciting, but I think most people find it, uh, to some extent, frightening, isn't it? I and mean, yes. we don't know whether we are still being, maybe, maybe, maybe you in the United States are now being controlled by, by alien. Uh, fake news that is coming from uh, from a distant planet. Well, that would explain a lot. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you know, the States are in Australia, so that's... Uh, yes, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. State, <laughs> I'm all right, right? for now. Yes, uh, the aliens will get me eventually. Um, yeah. When did you first meet... Let's, let's um, take some of the story back into space. When did you first meet Sir Fred Hoyle? Well, I uh, again, I, as I said, as a kid, I was used to uh, reading a lot of science fiction and also quite a lot of science as well. I read a a really beautiful little book called, uh, which was essentially Fred Hall's Read Lectures, one of the lectures, a series of lectures that he gave on the BBC, and uh, that was something that was transformative in my life. And uh, so I uh, I decided. Quite early on, when I was maybe 15 or 16, I would uh, go to university, study science, maths, physics, and so on, and try to get to Cambridge and to work with Fred Hall, which uh, fortunately turned out to be a reality in my case. And uh, so I, I did my undergraduate work in Sri Lanka, in St at the University of Ceylon, uh, did a mathematics degree, and I was the first batch, among the first batch of Commonwealth scholars. Uh, the British government started in, in 60, uh, came for uh, taking the best students from the Commonwealth, and that probably also includes Australia, uh, every year, and offering uh, and, and to offer them places at top universities in the UK. Uh, so I was fortunate to be a recipient of one of these uh, Commonwealth scholarships that were given to Sri Lanka. And so I went to Cambridge, and I went uh, to Trinity College, Cambridge, which was my father's old college. He also studied, my father studied, studied mathematics and astronomy in the 1930s. Uh, so I went there, and then I started uh, uh, collaborating and working under uh, the direction of the, the legendary astronomer of the 20th century, who was Sir Fred Hall. And I presume it was from him that you were first sort of exposed to the idea that, or, or, or was this something you'd kind of thought of in your science fiction youth, that um, some kind of panspermia or, or cosmogenesis or, or whichever word we want was in play as the, the best case uh, or the most credible answer for how there is life on Earth? Was, was this something you got from Fred? <laughs> well, I think it's a combination of uh, circumstances. I also happen to read amongst the uh, stuff that I read, I happened to read a, a novel called The Black Cloud, which Fred Hall had written just before I uh, arrived in Cambridge. And so this was one of the first things we talked about uh, just outside of science. We discussed this, and, and I was really intrigued. And, and he, Fred told me that he wrote The Black Cloud because in the 1950s, I think it was, he and a colleague called Ray Littleton had argued that, that there should be huge quantities of molecules, including organic molecules, in space. 
and uh, they had really quite uh, cogent arguments uh, to support this idea, to support the claim that there must be such molecules. But the astronomers of the day didn't like it, and they were sort of saying that this is total nonsense. Radio, radio astronomers had proved the shadow of doubt that there are no molecules, there are just only hydrogen atoms in space. Uh, so he and Lichten could not get the, this idea of organic molecules or any molecules in space published in the astronomical journals. And so the, he, he said that he, the next thing he did was to put it into science fiction, and that's the that genesis of the novel called The Black Cloud. I think it's a fantastic novel. This is an uh, intelligent cloud of uh, particles, organic particles, complex molecules that uh, uh, like more and more. This is rather like the, the comet that we talked about a little while ago. This is a huge cloud that was approaching the Earth, and the uh, the communication that uh, ensued between scientists on the Earth and the this intelligent cloud is the the story uh, the black cloud is based on. So I uh, so that really intrigued me, and, and my serious academic research started with an investigation into the nature of cosmic dust. We've known astronomers have known from the early nineteen. 20s, uh, certainly early 1930s, that there were huge quantities of dark matter material uh, in between the stars, and that stars are continually being made out of this material. Uh, if you look at the, the sky on a, on a moonless night, you see the, the huge uh, uh, Milky Way sort of arching across from horizon to horizon. And in between the stars of the Milky Way, there are conspicuous patches in various shapes like elephants trunks and so on horse there's a horse heads nebula uh, called horse heads nebula because it resembles the head of a horse and these nebulae are essentially dense clouds of dust particles and so the question is what are these dust particles made of at the time that i started my work in cambridge the astronomers of the day had uh, essentially made up their minds that these were really uninteresting little bits of ice that float around uh, in between the stars. So the ice grain theory, ice dust theory, was the fashionable theory that uh, astronomers uh, were all sort of locked into at that time. And when I began to reinvestigate the, the whole business of what the dust grains are made of, it turned out that the the ice grains was totally wrong. There was no way in which the ice would fit the the data that was emerging from astronomy and the new data that was emerging from astronomy. And it was more and more uh, the case that it was uh, um, dust that was made of carbon, carbon in the form of some organic material. Maybe some of it, some of it was soot, but there was a lot of organic uh, molecules there. Uh, and so this was the beginning of my. Uh, sort of expedition into panspermia, starting with the composition of cosmic dust. And uh, it's, I don't think people, who, for background, when I was in London, I used to work for Discovery Channel. And, and one of the, one of the idents, um, or, or one of the bumpers actually for a, a show we had, listed a fact that I'm not sure if it's still correct or if the numbers have changed, but 20 tons of space dust. Um, falls on the Earth, or 20 tons of um, extraplanetary material falls into the atmosphere, it's estimated, every day. And, uh, oh. and, and, and when we consider the size of the nebulae and, and so on, I don't think people um, realize the, the scale uh, and the volume of the material we're talking about when we are talking about um, how life moves between solar systems and across the galaxy. Yeah, or well, hundreds of tons. You know, I think the 20 is probably a older uh, number. Um, yeah. Um, it's, it's gone up a lot. I think there's a huge amount of material that's coming into the Earth every single day. And most of this is in the form of cometary dust. The, the interstellar dust, the cosmic dust, goes into comets, and then the comets essentially um, throw it out in the vicinity of the planets and so on. And so we plow through this uh, material uh, day in, day out. and uh, I mean, when 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 you have meteor showers, for instance, on on particular times of the year, what happens is that the Earth's uh, 
trajectory through space is essentially uh, going through a cloud of these uh, these particles, and uh, so you get uh, the various, and they come from comets. The particles are uh, sort of thrown out of comets, and so you get the Leonids in some time of the year. You get the uh, Taurids and so on, and they're called the Leonids and the Taurids because they appear to come from a point in the sky, but they're actually not coming from any definite point in the sky. We are just plowing through clouds of uh, debris that have been released from comets, clouds of dust. Um, yeah, I learned in the book it's uh, comets in the uh, inner part of the solar system can release a million tons uh, a day. That's, right. that's, in, that's an insane amount. I mean, it, when, this is probably why it's such a critical uh, area in astronomy is to work out what uh, what all this stuff, what nebulae and whatever are made of because we swim through it on a daily basis. We swim through it in a daily basis, uh, on a daily basis, and to ignore this, I think, is to our peril because we are ignoring a huge amount of material that uh, is certainly coming in and is certainly influencing everything that's happening on the Earth. And as far as biology and uh, as far as life is concerned, uh, once we have shown that these molecules in space and the dust in space is almost certainly very complex organic molecules, then the connection with life must be almost 100% certain. And so to, to continue searching, continue, continue maintaining that uh, life has nothing to do with the bigger universe is just crazy. You uh, mentioned organic molecules. Um, Dr. Wickramasin, can bacteria survive in space? I think so. I think the, there's no question that uh, experiments have been done, and scores of experience, experiments have been done over the last couple of decades. And every single experiment has shown that uh, bacteria uh, have an uncanny ability to survive the, the harsh conditions of space. They can survive the radiation conditions, the cosmic ray uh, fluxes that are prevalent in space. They can withstand that. They can withstand intense cold. They can withstand uh, intense heat. So that, I think there's no question that uh, bacteria are, are essentially born space travelers and great survivors. I mean, it doesn't need to be that every single bacterium survives. Uh, in order to make the panspermia argument uh, viable, we need only a very minute fraction of this stuff to be uh, to be alive, and uh, and then have, we have panspermia operating without any uh, without any, absolutely no doubt whatsoever. Um, but the survival is there is guaranteed, I think, from all the experiments that have been done to date. Do you think, um, sort of going back to that Arthur Clarke story about the CIA agent, do you think they, they knew about this from those NASA balloon flights in the 60s that um, sort of came down with the cold, if you will? I think so. In the, in the mid-1960s, early 1960s, before, the, before the, the space race really got going, uh, there was uh, at least two programs two research programs that were supported by NASA to send balloons and rockets to the high stratosphere. All, I think even as high as 80 kilometers, there were rocket um, flights that uh, brought back material and found microorganisms in large quantity. They found uh, um, familiar microorganisms and also some unfamiliar microorganisms. Uh, but uh, uh, again, there's another sort of argument, another sort of personal story that I should tell you. A man called Leslie Hale visited uh, me in Cardiff in, in the mid 19, late 1970s, saying that um, he had information that this program, the, 19, the early 1960s program that NASA started to look for microbes in the Earth's upper atmosphere, was suddenly. Stopped. It was suddenly truncated, ostensibly for lack of funds. But the the reason that it was truncated was that they were finding unequivocal evidence of microorganisms in the high stratosphere, and the uh, and this was uncomfortable because I think if it was admitted that these uh, uh, these kinds of uh, organisms exist in the high atmosphere, then maybe this the whole space program was in jeopardy. 
people would be worried that uh, in sending uh, rockets and so on out through the atmosphere, bringing them back, you might be bringing back uh, lethal microorganisms. So it could have been something like that. But Leslie Hale was part of this uh, early program of uh, investigating the uh, upper atmosphere for microorganisms. And, uh, and he told me that this uh, program, as soon as they started finding these org microbes, suddenly came to a halt. And uh, no further reports have come from the United States until, until relatively recently when they've been sending stuff to the International Space Station, microorganisms and so on, and finding that these survive. Uh, there's also the Russian experiments that uh, were done almost at the same time, finding very similar results. There were Russian rockets that were sent in the 19, early 1970s with uh, and brought back microorganisms and very recently there have been experiments that showed uh, the presence of microbial cells on the exterior of the international space station and these were reported by russian cosmonauts quite a distinguished cosmonaut led this particular program of uh, essentially sort of wiping clean the external windows of the International Space Station. Looking at what they found, they discovered that there were a huge range of algal forms, algal cells. Uh, some of them were sort of similar to ocean diatoms. Uh, diatoms are a kind of algae. Uh, some were somewhat different. Some were different from the familiar types, but uh, there was no doubt that microorganisms were appearing uh, on the exterior, on the outside the windows of the International Space Station. Uh, this was, I think this made big news in the, in the uh, sort of popular news press, in news media. The, the Russian uh, press had a big story of, on this, and there's a lot on the internet. I think if you look up the internet, there's a huge amount of data on this. but. So far, uh, there's been no publication of the results in any of the, uh, the sort of European or American journals. There's been deathly silence as to what this, whether this was true or not, or what it means. Uh, we just do not, do not know. I think there's a lot of stuff happening that is uh, slightly peculiar in respect of uh, microbes high up in the, in the atmosphere. The uh, the ideological barrier is different by country and culture, isn't it? It's obviously worst with European, American, uh, particularly US um, resistance to the idea, which I presume is an artifact of the Cold War. But Russia has, um, well, when it was the Soviet Union as well, there was the um, they were a lot more open to. Um, Mars being something other than a dead, um, pointless rock. Uh, and the same thing with India and so on. There's a, a ideological, uh, the barrier is different or the rules are different by culture when looking at this stuff, aren't they? I think so. I think the Russians are slightly, slightly more open, I think, to the idea that uh, panspermia is a, is a viable proposition. And certainly in, in the, um, the Indians have been very, very positive. And we, in, in fact, Fred Hall and I, in the 19, late 1980s, early 1990s, we, was, we were trying to get some space agency or some balloon flights agency to probe the upper atmosphere, the stratosphere, once again, and to look for incoming microorganisms. And we couldn't get any, we, we had no joy at all from uh, British aerospace or from the American various space organizations, but the Indian, research, in Indian Space Research Organization picked it up really quite uh, readily, picked, picked up the project. In 2001, we flew, along with the Indian Space Research Organization, we flew balloons to heights of four, between 40 and 50 kilometers, and we brought, we brought back microorganisms that were unquestionably non-terrestrial. Uh, and we had great difficulty having the, these results published, but we had 
published some of these results in, in very sort of prestigious peer-reviewed journals. Uh, but still, it hasn't really been uh, ac accepted uh, readily by mainstream science. They just tend to ignore these results. Uh, that's in, the, in 2001. And in, from 2010 onwards, my colleagues in the University of Sheffield, led by uh, Professor Milton Mainwright has been repeating uh, similar projects. They've sent, uh, they sent balloons to 25 to 30 kilometers, still in the stratosphere, not as high as the Indians and certainly not as high as the Russians uh, or the Americans in the 1960s. But from 30 kilometers, the Sheffield group has brought back microorganisms that are really quite bizarre and uh, inexplicable in terms of what we know to be terrestrial, well-attested terrestrial biology. So the, the data is coming in steadily, and um, the unfortunate situation is that uh, we don't have all the resources that are really available worldwide to, to continue this project. One of the reasons that I'm in Sri Lanka now is that the Sri Lankan uh, the National Institute of Fundamental Studies is uh, an institute that I founded uh, in the 1980s. They have taken up this really quite seriously, and they're going to fly balloons from central Sri Lanka to 40 or 50 kilometers and collect uh, uh, whatever is there and to look for microbial material using the, the sort of really the most up-to-date uh, DNA uh, techniques to, uh, to map the, uh, the DNA of these organisms and to try to establish that they're, they're non-terrestrial. So it's happening, and as, as you said, the, the cultural impasse that uh, we face in the United Kingdom and in the United States is, is not there when you, when you come to places like where I am today in Sri Lanka or really. Or in India or in Japan. And the Japanese are also very interested in this. And although they tend to line themselves up a little bit more than the Indians with Brits, with the British and the Americans, they're also, I think, uh, moving in the direction of, uh, of accepting panspermia as a valid or inevi essentially inevitable scientific result. It says something. Uh, I mean, it, it's all, it's really noble work given the lack of resources and, and just how few experiments have been performed. But it says something about just how filthy space is that any time you send up the balloon, it actually does come back and, and, and supports the thesis. I mean, uh, the prevalence of, of biological material in space is the, is the, part that I try to impress on people, like throw a balloon up, it'll come down with some stuff. I mean, not as bad as that, but it will come down with some stuff on it. And you think yeah. we're, we're absolutely missing um, a, a huge part of the story of the planet here. Yeah, that's right. I mean, every, every single attempt that has been made from the mid-1960s onwards has produced a positive result. And the tendency to dismiss the result as being contamination um, sort of laboratory or terrestrial contamination has been really quite a, a weird business because uh, they, they would go to almost any kind of uh, imaginary situation to, su to suggest that these are not really genuine alien organ uh, organisms but they are terrestrial contaminants. And another, another argument that's been used is that the, the Indian stuff that we collected in, the 19 in 2001 uh, they were they were different from terrestrial organisms. Different to the extent that some of them were named after astronomers, and there is a, one microorganism called uh, uh, with with the name of Hoyle, and another with the name of uh, an Indian astronomer called Aryabhatta. Right? They, so they were they were different, distinct enough from terrestrial genotypes to, to, to be named as, as different organisms, but they have an overlap in terms of DNA, and this is regarded as being proof that they came from outside, uh, that, that, sorry, that they came from the ground. A totally bogus uh, situation because we know that if microbes are coming down from space, continually coming down from space, then what we find today in the stratosphere 
must have some resemblance to what is on the ground, isn't it? There's to be some absolutely similarity, and so it's not a. It's, it's it's not the, proof of contamination. It's it's no, it's proof that it's a continuous process. Like of course sure. it's going to match. Absolutely, it's going to match to some extent, and that's what's happening. And this that's used as an argument against uh, alien origins. Well, we've we've spoken about um, bacteria and so on, but uh, um, well, let's start here. Actually, Doctor Wickramasing, what is a virus? A virus is a, a stretch of DNA or RNA that can add on to a, a cellular organism. Uh, it can infect a cellular organism, that's what disease-causing bacteria viruses do. Or it can um, add on to the, uh, t- to the germline, essentially modify the organism's potential for evolution. So you can bring new body plans, you can bring new um, forms of life and so on, uh, simply, by, simply coming in from outside from a different sort of far-flung places in the universe and adding to organisms that are already on the Earth. So this, I think this is a process by which evolution has occurred on the Earth, the whole progression of life from simple microbes to multicelled uh, to, to uh, multicellular life and so on, all the way to humans, they have been punctuated. All these different steps of evolution have required the introduction of new genes, and these new genes came through viruses. So viruses, to answer the short answer to your question, is a virus is a set of instructions that are, that are in the form of either RNA or DNA, uh, it cannot replicate, it cannot reproduce without uh, the machinery of a, of a cell, of a living cell, of a bacterium, or a, or a living cell of a higher life form. Um, but, uh, but it has the potential to make new life. And, and unlike, I mean, I'm perfectly satisfied that bacteria can um, survive in space, but because, and, and this is certainly a gray area as to whether you would consider a virus alive, particularly when you're looking at some of the, you know, earlier paleoviruses, but it, they absolutely can survive in space. This isn't a thing that is, is up for debate. Viruses, um, because they are information, essentially, um, can survive in space. They kind of, and they're smaller, smaller targets, so they have a better chance of survival as well. Uh, the the smaller the target, the, uh, the the less punishment it gets from cosmic rays and so on. So they, they have a much better chance of uh, of absolute survival. And and it seems surprising that um, right away we have the opportunity to enhance. Um, current evolutionary understanding and and plug some of the holes of which there are many in the kind of um sort of gradual development from less complex to increasingly complex sort of um symphonic progression that um which is which hasn't actually been science for a hundred years but it is what people think uh, of when they think of evolution because it goes in it goes in jumps and 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 uh and mutations that are too extreme to be um, as a result of, of, of local environment. Uh, and, and right away we have like, well, we're, we're swimming through um, hundreds of tons of, uh, of alien material, which must include viruses every yeah. day. Uh, yeah. and, and you have, and this is very dear to my heart, I gave a presentation in London in 2016, where, um, which included a sequence on the octopus. Uh, and yeah. when I hit yeah. this bit in the book, I'm like, oh, yeah. Uh, Dr. Yeah, Rick Ramasing, tell us, tell yeah, us about the octopus. Yeah, that's a great story. In fact, let me let me just go back backtrack a little bit. I mean, you talk about the uh, the need for viruses uh, adding to uh, sort of genetic complement and so on. But if you look at them, if you just take the standard story that life just emerged from the earth from a random mixture of organic molecules, and then the the whole progression of evolution thereafter was. Uh, 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 an accumulation of copying errors. That's the story that, uh, that we are meant to believe, isn't it? Yeah. That you have a, a simple cell, a simple bacterium cell, a bacterial cell, the bacterium copies itself, its genome uh, over and over again. And the copying is not 100%, so there are, there's an occasional 
introduction of, of copying errors. And if the copying error is favorable to some kind of uh, survival situation, that is taken over uh, and, and, and amplified and so on. It goes on like that. Uh, so if this is all that is happening, then there are many, many points that uh, in the story of life that are totally, totally inexplicable. Take, for instance, the, the bacterium that's arrived. Now we know for sure that the first bacteria arrived on the Earth or started, began on the Earth between 4.1 and 4.2 billion years ago. And this was a time when the Earth was just being violently pounded by comet impacts, right? It's called the Hadean Epoch, Epoch of Hell. And in the rocks that formed during this uh, time, we find unambiguous evidence of microbial life. That the, the, the evidence is in the form of little grains of carbon uh, with isotope signatures of life. But nevertheless, there's the bacteria. People accept that they're now scientists accept without much dissent that there's life, bacterial life, at 4.1 billion years ago. Right, so these, these bacteria that keep copying time and time again, over and over again, and for another 2 billion years, nothing happens. Bacteria remain bacteria, right? Uh, and then suddenly, about uh, 2 billion years lapse, elapse, and then you have a, a cell with a nucleus, a eukaryotic cell. The first cells are called prokaryotes, and then you have the first eukaryote uh, appearing nearly 2 billion years afterwards. So what's happening? I mean, this is totally bizarre, isn't it? If you have your um, pure Darwinian evolution, you would have had everything happening in the first billion years. After all, the Earth had a diversity of, uh, of different types of climate and so on and locations for doing things, and nothing happens. And then another, another uh, nearly 2 billion years have to lapse before you get from... Uh, uh, cells with the nuclei from eukaryotes to multicell life, and that happened about what three point uh, just five hundred and forty million years ago, half a billion years ago. Say there was a huge explosion of life, which is the, the Cambrian explosion. And after that, there's this, and the octopus. Uh, let me come to the octopus now. The octopus is a very very interesting story because. Uh, it's very uh, close relative, relative to the octopus is a squid, right? The squid and the octopus share uh, some common heritage, but they are essentially a universe apart. The octopus is far, far superior in terms of its genetic capability, in, term of, in terms of its functional capability, than the squid. And the, the octopus has something like... Uh, I mean, human, being, human beings have about 20, 25,000 genes or something, right? Useful genes that are doing all our um, biochemistry, including our brain biochemistry. And the octopus has more than double that number of genes. So it's an incredibly complex animal. And um, it uh, essentially arose, uh, and scientists have been talking about the evolution from a squid. And there's no way in which that could have happened unless the, the squid was injected with a huge amount of new information that made it uh, the creature that we now recognize to be the octopus. Uh, because so as with a lot of these big jumps, um, uh, and this is one of the frankly valid uh, criticisms of, shall we say, classic Darwinianism, that it emerged yeah. suddenly. 400 million years ago like that's the that's the sort of divergence and and this is an organism that uh you know um, can uh, unlock cars and communicate with you know weird changes in light and and possibly plan a bank raid um there yeah. it's it's a remarkable and, and terrifying organism and it is so different from the squid and as you say it, it has double the amount of you know protein coding genes that that humans yeah. do um yeah. it is it is the other kind of high form of life on this planet i think so and and, and we don't know what uh, kind of perception it has, but it hasn't, it's, it's got eyes and so on. It's got um, a complex system of 
or detecting uh, signals in the environment, maybe it can understand the universe. Maybe it can uh, it knows more about cosmology than uh, human cosmologists do at the moment, because we are we are still fumbling. I think we have major major problems in cosmology. The standard Big Bang cosmology says that everything started about 13.8 billion years ago, and in the last uh, two or three years, astronomers have been finding galaxies that formed, uh, supposedly formed, maybe a few tens of millions of years after this Big Bang. It shouldn't have been there. Those galaxies shouldn't be there. And they look like modern galaxies. So I think the whole story of cosmology is also flawed. Flawed to that's, find that. Uh, I happen to agree, but that's Sir Fred's influence there, isn't it? I, I'm not a Big Bang person myself. No, no. It's, it's present. In a sort of general sort of way, but uh, I think the evidence that is uh, is accumulating now is going really briskly against the the standard conventional sort of Big Bang cosmology. But that's another story. It is. I wanted to like why the octopus is so important, and, and why I mentioned it is it is the best example I think of the uh, of how we should view the Earth as an open system rather than a closed one, because people can generally get their head around the idea of panspermia as almost a, but they still map it to a biblical creation event. There's still a sort of in the beginning, which is, you know, some squishy, dirty rocks landed on the earth uh, and, and we got biological material from it and, and, and off we went. But yeah. uh, the, the octopus is the one, is the smoking gun, as far as I'm concerned, that this happens yeah, yeah. all the time. Yeah, I think so. I think there's no question about it. And there's a, there's a huge amount of data that's now accumulating that is just backing up that story to the point that you just cannot ignore the data. The data is is really crushing evidence against the standard point of view and in support of panspermia. And sooner or later, people have really have to accept it. Otherwise, uh, otherwise, the, the, there would be any, there wouldn't be any more science in the universe, isn't it, or in the world, mm. on the earth. And, and it's interesting. Um, so, it, it particularly as this has been a bad. Uh, flu season for the Northern Hemisphere. Uh, it's interesting that that appears to be cyclical. It's 100 years from um, Spanish flu uh, and yeah. so on. And when you see cycles, um, it, it it sort of suggests, well, there's there's something going on here. Uh, and, and it's tempting to kind of think, well, I wonder if we – uh, I wonder if if there's a regular object that shows up that happens to have <laughs> a particularly nasty flu virus on it or or something think, because you know it's it's it, interesting to consider that if viruses well because they do viruses can survive in space and we swim through them yeah yeah but comets have periods isn't it Com comets are periodic uh, and lots of the solar system events that we have seen through right through the history of the solar system they tend to be periodic right and uh, so periods that uh, that we see, the periodicities that we see, are probably uh, astronomical periodicities. And uh, I think I think the, the the fact that the flu has come 100 years after the the great flu pandemic of 18, 1918, 1919 is probably highly significant. Yeah, and uh, I mean this is the other half of the book, which um, I'll, I'll say for your co-author. Um, matches some of this information because it's it's compelling when you said we we, we really need to update cosmology yeah, I'm i agree you. is it I'm, I'm still here if you're still here yeah no are, are you okay on the on the communication i'm yep. sort of okay one yeah, last I, question um well one sort of topic area like when we talk about viruses as a uh, potentially cyclical and the fact that comets have regular orbits, as you said. It's interesting, and this is the other half of the book with your co-author, Robert Baval, to map some of the stuff we know uh, mm. from your scientific research to, say, the world's mythologies and spiritual systems. And, and in particular, when you think of uh, astrological systems having a, a profound suspicion of comets. It, it's it's kind of one of those pieces. That, like, do you wonder if this is information that we've sort of um, intuitively known for a while? I think so. I mean, I, I'm uh, I'm not. Uh, I, I don't support everything that's in the second part. Uh, we wrote the book in two parts because uh, I, I I don't really absolutely. Uh, agree with the entire content of the second part of the book. I mean, I think the details are, are, are beyond me to check in terms of the veracity of the, 
all of this stuff is in the second part of the book. But um, uh, I'm in general sympathy with the, the thesis that uh, uh, some condition like that is has to be valid. There's no there's no question that uh, if if transperma is the correct answer to the origins of life, then we've got to take the second part of the book as a serious extension of the uh, of the idea yeah absolutely all of the details are still um, I, I would still sort of quibble a little bit about the details but that's neither here nor there oh no oh, for sure and and it's a it's early days uh because we, we've barely arguably even haven't uh, reached a sufficient consensus consensus on something like panspermia to turn around and go, well, do we, uh, because I wrote a book that's sort of like that, um, do, if we look back through history and mythology, are there stories and accounts that if we hold up in the light of um, new scientific information, and I have to choose my words carefully here because I hate the idea that science, quote unquote, explains something. Cosmologically and philosophically, the yeah, mystery yeah. remains. It's um, we, yeah, we just have yeah. different descriptions. But yeah, it does yeah, seem... Yeah, it's, nothing to solve, doesn't it? We, we just approach solutions, and the solutions are always uh, uh, somewhat distant. Absolutely, and and for me, the comments is part of it. And and if you look at the the frankly terrifying uh, Sumerian creation myths that sound like you know um, solar plasma ejector and and weird stuff landing on the earth, and you just you just sort of squint at it and think, I wonder if this is a cultural memory of yeah. of, of things that have happened. Yeah, absolutely. The flood, for instance, uh, we know we know now that the, uh, the the end of the the last ice age was almost certainly marked with the the, the younger Dryas uh, episode was punctuated by some cometary fragments hitting the earth, isn't it? That's been more and more. Uh, there's more and more evidence to support that. Yeah, absolutely. So that um, I. I find that when we talk about we we have a dysfunctional cosmology, and I don't think we solve that un until we solve um, problems in physics and, and and all the other stuff as well. Uh, and it'll never be correct, we, but we're, we're kind yeah. of stale, uh, and and the the interpretation does not match the data. But it's yeah. um, it's very useful to think uh, and and philosophize about the implications of of the sort of. Uh, of the work you've done uh, over the course of your career, because as far as I'm concerned, the evidence is open and shut that uh, little old Earth is um, is is playing in a much much bigger game than than we often uh, than we often think, and that that's very beautiful to sit and think with. Yeah. Well, Dr. Wickramasinghe, I loved the book. Your your half was my favorite, I'm not going to lie. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and this has been an excellent chat. Uh, I, um, Thank you. I, I, nice. yeah. I will have all the details about um, your website and, and, and the book, of course, in, in the show notes. But for, you know, for people listening and they want to know more, uh, where should they go to find out more? Well, I suppose the website is fun. Uh, I mean, the, the profchandra.org website has a lot of uh, stuff that's worth looking at, but uh, generally on the inter internet, there's a lot of stuff on panspermia. Some of them are derogatory, some of them are anti-panspermia, but I think it's worth looking at the whole story, the pros and the cons, because the truth is always approached, I think, asymptotically, right? It's like a mathematician, uh, asymptote is a, is the, is a curve that is is approached uh, over t over a long length of the x-axis, but it never reaches where it wants to get to, isn't it? I mean, it's mm -hmm. sort of so I think, I think the truth is reached asymptotically, and that's that's going to be the case for the next thousands of years. So. Here's one for you. Think back to the recent discussion with Dr. Rupert Sheldrake on panpsychism, putting aside its shortcomings as a sufficient explanatory model for now. He made the very good point that from panpsychism up in terms of models of the universe that incorporate consciousness, a necessary implication is considering, for instance, whether or not the sun is conscious. Now, 
Take that idea and think about this discussion with Dr. Wickrama Singh, particularly around our planet swimming in and being bombarded with vast amounts of organic material and viruses and so on. I wrote a post recently on the blog called Will You Know It When You See It regarding what actual alien contact uh, would look like. Terence McKenna once said that the biggest problem with an alien invasion is to know when you've got one. Well, The complete failure of abiogenesis to model the emergence of life on Earth, plus Dr. Wickramasinghe's 40 years of research, suggests we live in a state of continuous alien invasion in a way. And when you start seeing the Earth as an open system, the philosophical implications of this position expand to the edges of the known universe. When you fold in pre-scientific and non-scientific modes of understanding, magic, remote viewing, indigenous cosmologies, and so on, and make the sound case that these epistemologies have their own accurate means of truth validation, well, you get starships. You get a way of thinking with the entire universe from a kinship perspective without having to channel six-foot blonde, uh, you know, humanoids from Zeta Reticuli. So if that sort of thing sounds like your jam, get yourself a copy of Cosmic Womb. The second half isn't up to much, and I say that as a huge Robert Baval fan. But if you picture starships as the second half of Cosmic Womb, then you'll be really cooking with gas. Anyway, that's enough sciencing for this week. Uh, if you like what you hear, be sure to subscribe to the show in your favorite podcatcher or on YouTube. Find Rune Soup on Facebook or at runesoup.com. And find me on Twitter or I am Gordon, G O R D O N underscore White, W H I T E. Until next time. Music.